Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life. Well, it is 2326. Uh, 23, 26, 23 hours and 26 minutes into the 16th day of November 2021, and we are here uh, doing our now Gnosis vlog. We just finished the observation vlog. Gnosis comes in to us in a very bizarre way, and I do have a hard time sort of connecting everything together because I have to come up with the uh, essay off the top of my mind. And sometimes, well, more often than not, I forget what I'm going to say. <laughs> Turn the camera on. I was going to say something, but it's all gone now. And But you will see that in the last observation vlog, I was talking about Gnosis and particularly the, the reality of Gnosis and how Gnosis comes in and creates classes. One of the left hand, one of the paths of Gnosis, the left hand path, describes a sense of physicality where the reality of the situation is focused on the physical presence and not on the spiritual, and is there to destroy the soul. This is why they participate in acts that are basically physical in nature. And in many cases, offensive to the soul. People will view this as demonic. They talk about the devil. They talk about Satan. They talk about uh, Lucifer, Luciferian, uh, Masonic, and a whole bunch of other things. But the thing is, it goes much further than that and has a lot more of a dynamic sense than most people are aware of. And this is why you use the term gnosis. But again, Gnosis itself has a particular problem because Gnosis can be defined in a number of different ways, particularly on depending on the branch you're going down. Uh, in a full understanding of Gnosis, let's give you the, that definition here. Gnosis is actually metanosis. It's the, it's the metaphys metaphysics of reality. Uh, this metaphysics was known by Newton. It was known by Einstein. And it continued on into M theory, uh, particularly as you move through the path of uh, Linus Pauling and into um, this is how Jung picks up his work, uh, and into uh, particle theory, where now you have something known as the parallel universes. This is how the multiverse emerges in terms in, on the scientific side of things. The multiverse never really fundamentally existed uh, prior to basically 1990. Uh, the multiverse was primarily a Gnosis concept, a concept of beyond physics, a metaphysical content, concept. And in my view, this was, this was uh, years ago, and that's what ended up sort of bringing the points together, uh, I think around 2018, when I began to realize the interconnection between physics, quantum physics, uh, particle physics, and then metaphysics, that, that metaphysics was the next step. And so that began a shift in my focus, began a shift in my path. And, of course, it's not a quick one. It's, it's, it's something that you acclimate to. It's not, it doesn't occur immediately. It's not instantaneous. And the thing is, so you move from Planck to Einstein to Linus Pauling. And from Linus Pauling, you get into M-theory. Now, here's what the problem is. We're getting into some of the geometry here. We're getting into some of the physics and they talk about dimensions. Dimensions, and this is why they talk about the metaverse. Uh, and this is where you get into the matrix, because the matrix is a mathematical concept as well. And you talk about an n-dimensional matrix. Well, the problem is, and this is where the flat earthers come in as well. Uh, all of our geometry is described in flat space geometry. This is why the flat earthers are flat earthers. 
because everything is described in flat space geometry. Uh, that's Euclid, that's Pythagoras, uh, and a number of others. And this is way before this is way before Europe even comes onto the scene. Uh, what ends up happening? Well, if we, give me give you some some degree of an example. Some of the early mathematics that we see today, if you ever studied trigonometry, you did the trigonometry on the circle, and you used triangles. Well, that's what Pythagoras was. That, the, if you look at the entire Pythagorean work, that's what he was doing. It wasn't just the it wasn't just the Pythagorean theorem. That was just the the the, 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 the that's just the, sort of the, the tip of the iceberg is, is barely is barely uh, uh, making any dent in terms of your understanding. Uh, but anyway, that gives you sort of an indication there's actually something a lot more a lot more behind what you have initially seen. And the way they describe it, you have now you describe the Euclidean, Euclidean, Euclidean space as three dimensions. You have the length, width, and then you have the height. That's the third dimension. The problem is, once you start getting into curved spaces, and this is why they were using triangles, it's extremely difficult to measure. In other words, they couldn't take measurements along the curved path. So they broke it up into a series of triangles along the path and then summed up the areas of the triangle to get the area under that curved path. That's calculus. That's integral called calculus, and then also known as path, uh, 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 these are also known as path integrals, where you're taking, you're finding the area or the path of a particular integral, depending on whether it's in two, three, two, three, two or three dimensions. Here's where the problem comes in. When they continued working on the dimensions, they continued working in Euclidean space. So they used the, the, the Cartesian graph, which is the Cartesians work Euclideans. They were working in flat space. They took their, the, the Cartesian understanding, the Euclidean understanding, and extended it into the fourth dimension, which, fourth dimension, which is time, and then to n dimensions, which, has, which was undefined at the time. Uh, Particle theory, M theory, was the specific of it, brings in the concept of parallel universes using Euclidean understanding. So that's why they call them parallel universes. They're one sort of stacked up to each other, you know. And this is what I call M theory is for a manifold manifold theory that you have M number you have a sort of M number of universes stacked up together, and this is where they now come in with with superposition that all these different uh, realities formally exist and just one takes over once you have the observation and all these things. But the thing is, it, these are these are explanations of observations. The observation of quantum mechanics, which is possible, brings up a collapse of conventional physics. And this is how we're going to get into this. And this is how you get into metaphysics. Because what happens after the third dimension, the fourth dimension, doesn't exist in Euclidean space. It's non I would say at this point, it's non-Euclidean. And how do I, what do I mean by that? Well, if you take your, my finger here, and you just go along that line there, that's my finger, that's, the, that's the sort of like a height. Well, this exists in time. But it's not, and when we talk about, if I'm talking about uh, parallel, this is parallel, these two fingers together are parallel. If I move the finger like this at a right angle, that is perpendicular, or, or, or it's also called orthogonal. Anytime you hear about something that's being orthogonal, it's at a right angle to it. Well, what happens? Time exists along this length. If I put my finger here like this to create an orthogonal two-dimensional uh, 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 graph, or a system, time is still still is still parallel to this, but it's also parallel parallel to that. It's also parallel to the bottom line. It's parallel to each dimension at the exact same time. This is an impossibility. This is where the system come, becomes undefined. You cannot have it being parallel to the to the vertical and to the horizontal at the exact same time in Euclidean space. So now we're dealing with a non-Euclidean dimension. And unfortunately, there's no such thing. 
There is no mathematics beyond the Euclidean mathematics. We do not have a mathematics that brings us into uh, what we call non-Euclidean geometry. And this is where all this stuff falls apart. And it was fine before when you were just simply dealing with, with uh, you know, uh, what we'll call Newtonian mechanics. And this was, you know, cannonballs and stuff like that. Once you started messing around with the atom, things started occurring in a manner that you had to start considering the fourth dimension, time as a dimension. But the thing is, if you used it, and this is what most scientists did, they used time as a Euclidean space. A large chunk of your observations will be completely off because time is not Euclidean. It's, not, it's, it's a non-Euclidean system. But it's intersecting with the with, with a real system, a three dimensional system. The only the closest thing I can come in terms of its mathematical uh, understanding is if you're dealing with complex numbers. Uh, you, if you understand what an imaginary number is, imaginary number is when you take the square root of a negative number. So you have uh, four. The square root of four is two because two times two is equal to four. You take the square root uh, of four and that becomes two. Right. You have eight, right? You take the cube. You take the cubed root of eight. Well, actually, let's, let's, let's keep it the, to the square. So, so you have four. Four times four is sixteen. So you take the square root of sixteen it gives you four. The problem is, let's say now you have in your mathematics, you end up with a negative two or a negative four. How do you take the square root? Because if you multiply a negative times a negative, so a negative 2 times negative 2 is equal to positive 4. That's integers. But what happens if you need to take the square root, square root of a negative number? Right? Negative 2, negative 4. Well, there's no way to do it. So what they do is they create something known as an imaginary number. You remove, you remove the negative, assuming that it's a, uh, it's, this is a direction and you're dealing with what's we'll called the magnitude. You're dealing with the number itself. The magnitude is simply the number without direction. Although this is a poor understanding because there can be more to the negative than we understand. But they were, but they consider this and just simply remove the negative and place an i uh, next to the number. So now you can take the you can take the the, the square root of of of, of the, the four i squared, right, and it becomes two i, two so two i, and times two i is equal to four i squared. That's your imaginary numbers. When you add an imaginary number to a regular number, you have one plus two i, because you can't add them together. It's, it, they're two separate things, so they stay separate. You now have an intersecting plane of real versus imaginary. That's a complex number. This is what we get. This is this is an, a an exemplary an, an exam <laughs> an example of what happens in non Euclidean space. So you do have an example of it. And a large chunk of your work in lasers and things that are in, in quantum mechanics often involve complex numbers with a complex plane. In other words, you have events going on that are outside our fundamental understanding of Euclidean space. And so what happens is you, you, the, the, the approximation, the unknowns within your understanding, your mathematical understanding, are quite significant. And so this is, what, this is as you start dealing with this mathematics, it opens up the doors for things that we just simply didn't understand or expect when you're dealing with something more simple like the, 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 the like dropping a bowling ball or shooting a cannon, or shooting a cannon, right? And you want to do the physics of of the projectile. You want to do projectile physics. That's your parabolic arc. You know, as you fire a cannon, the ball shoots up with its height, and you see the arc that it has. It comes back down to earth. And oh, well, this is this is you know, no real sort of hidden uh, uh, understanding there. Uh, but if you start, start, as soon as you start getting into splitting the atom, now you've got a problem. Now, as they began to do the subatomic sub exploration, this is what Planck had been working on. He was working on ultraviolet, radi ultra, ultraviolet radiation and sunlight. This is how they came up with the term 
photon for the particle that is light. Uh, and this is what he was working on. And he began to see and understand that, that, that these, these particles, these light beams, didn't behave according to classical theory. And he didn't simply follow theory, he experimented. He did the observation. But again, this is left out of school. School is, it doesn't show you this. It keeps science locked within this magical sphere of, oh, we know everything. Did you know? Well, that's, not, that's, not, that's not current science. That's, that's classical science. That's the science of the 1800s. Did you know? It's a fact. No. That doesn't exist currently. Science has to be done by observation. What the scientists are doing now, who, but most times because it's easier to do than sitting out here and doing the observational work. But what are they doing? They're, they're, doing, they're doing the work of Fibonacci. They're doing the work of, uh, of Da Vinci. They're working on code. They're working on prediction. And it never worked. It never, never has worked. And so what happens, our concept of the metaverse comes out, particularly before 1990, comes out of uh, Hinduism primarily. A large chunk of it comes in as Ram Das uh, becomes a guru, comes back to uh, the United States. He's now a guru. And you have the, the, uh, the sort of the hippies who were the nihilists now dropping out of socialism, dropping out of humanism, and going into spiritualism. This is the path of the nihilist into the hippie. The hippie uh, becomes the spiritual gurus, uh, but they don't go too far. Uh, they simply stay within the lovey-dovey, anything goes, which is particularly the le particularly left-hand path. Left-hand path is very selfish. It is about self-love. It is about uh, these your mind, body, soul healing so that you, you always feel good. Where the right-hand path is in Gnosis, and this includes Hinduism and Buddhism, the right-hand path is selflessness. You give up comfort like Christ did. You give up establishment. You give up status and ranking for non-existence. You, you, you go into a state of non-existence. You have no social status. You're giving up social status. So this is what I'm saying is that someone who has no social status is not necessarily in a bad position. It doesn't necessarily mean they can't do well. This is the constraints. This is the matrix. This is the created reality that is taught to us in school from when we were very young. The whole world that we see today is, is based on selfishness. This is why self-esteem becomes so important. Let's go into the definition of self-esteem. Self is our, ourself. It's something we do ourselves. Esteem is an accolade, and it's not a low accolade. They're a low accolade. Well, he's a good person. Uh, that's a low accolade. Something else is telling you, oh, he is a good person. To say that, oh, he's an amazing person, that's a high accolade. This, if you called yourself, oh, I'm an amazing person. Oh, you should see the stuff I do. That's narcissism. That's self love. That's selfishness. But what would what, what we teach our kids today? Esteem. Esteem is an accolade, it's a high accolade that others give to us. We have to earn it. We have to be we have to earn that level, level of respect that we become esteemed. He's the, he's an esteemed professor. And once again I have to go and make a correction here, uh, a, a sort of a notation, not necessarily a correction, a notation that he is not a gender. He is anthropomorphic in this case. Includes both men and women. Anthropomorphic is specific to man, the species. Apparently, people from Oxford and his higher ups don't seem to understand this. If you're a person who's using pronouns and concerned about proper pronouns, then you do not understand basic English. Because basic English says man, human being, that's anthropomorphic. And the pronoun is he. Because he is a pronoun for man, the species, anthropomorphic. This is why you have policeman, not gender, 
police man. Man is anthropomorphic, not a gender. Fireman, again, anthropomorphic, not in gender. R refers to the species of man, includes both men and women. This has been something that has been basic for a long time. It's been removed from the schools, like everything else, uh, because it was racial. And really, what they're doing, what, again, this is how created reality works. You, can, you remove any sense of reference to history, anything that can be viewed as a distraction that pulls the focus away from uh, where it needs to be in terms of what you're trying to create. In other words, the person's mind, the kids, the children's mind in the school has to be focused on the created reality that is being presented. And this is sort of what happens today. And part of the reality is, is that they're using esteem, uh, like the esteem professor. Now you're going to have to give yourself the esteem. You create your own high accolade for yourself. You walk around as if you are the best person in the world. That you are this intellectual. As a vegan, you walk around. We are better than everybody else. As a cyclist who goes through track, and I see them, the cyclists on their bikes, very proud to be cyclists because they're going through other. They're weaving in and out of traffic, skimming between. There are two cars lined up on the lanes. There, they're skimming between them, not staying in the proper lane. Going through stop signs because they have the right of way. They are better than everyone else. They are cyclists. They are saving the earth. Vaxxers are doing exactly the same thing. They are better than everyone else. They know what to do. And if you don't agree with them, they're sending you off to a detention camp now. Or an internment camp. This is what's being discussed. This is what's happening in Austria. This is what's happening in Australia. And I think behind the scenes, though, behind the scenes of all of this, are your uh, Gnostics. The, the, your your higher-ups, the people who control things, are still your imperial class. And the imperial class are Gnostics. They, are still, they still fully believe in all the magic. And they're going to try to get as much mag magic for themselves as they possibly can. And I just showed you before how you move from, from physics to quantum physics, to particle physics, to metaphysics. Metaphysics is gnosis. It's been there all along. So there really isn't a disconnect between physics, between science, and the spiritual world. It's been there from the beginning. And your major scientists, major scientists except for Stephen Hawking, knew this. Hawking is the exception to the rule, or to the standard. How you take this from here on out is up to you, but we still do have to do a lot of work before we really uh, sort of get into what's actually happening and how the world interacts with Gnosis on a regular and daily basis. Anyways, uh, that's it for now, and on to uh, the... Uh, Transitions vlog. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween and Middle School for Life. Those are